Hey, welcome everyone. We're very excited to have with us uh, Shirley Liu from GB20 Therapeutics. Uh, Shirley, you may not know this, but you were my TA at Stanford for a computational biology class, the <laughs> Russ Altman. And I remember, I still remember your lecture on Gibbs sampling. So it was very good. So, Thank you. Uh, and uh, Shirley's moved from strength to strength. So right now she's the co-founder and CEO of GB20 Therapeutics. It's an immuno-oncology drug discovery company that uses CRISPR screens. And Shirley's famous for using CRISPR screens cancer and AI approaches for, to, for drug discovery. And it has a proprietary AI platform for uh, to design fully human uh, functional antibodies. Uh, and uh, GB20 is developing these antibodies into immuno-oncology drugs uh, for clinical trials. So uh, a very exciting topic. Uh, Shirley received her PhD in biomedical informatics and a minor in computer science from Stanford in 2002. And before GV20, as many of you know, she was a professor of biostatistics and computational biology at Dana-Farber and Harvard. And one of the pioneers really in uh, computational biology analysis of regulatory genomics. And she was a staple of many regulatory genomics conferences uh, back in the day. Uh, uh, director of the Center for Functional Cancer Epigenetics Dana Farber, or she was an associate member of Broad and MIT and Harvard. And uh, she worked, she developed lots of groundbreaking algorithms that are standard in the field. So Max was a was the default algorithm for gypsy calling and CISROM and scan beta. And then Magic, her algorithm for uh, yeah, interpreting the results from CRISPR screens is also a standard in the field. And then she's done great work on algorithms for tumor immunity, timer tide trust. And uh, uh, like many computational biologists, she moved into a more and more applied direction and uh, contributed to the discovery of cancer drug response markers, drug resistant mechanisms, combination therapies, uh, stellar publication record, uh, and sky high H index and all that. And uh, she's contributed well to scientific societies, uh, ISCB, American Institute of Medical Biological Engineering, uh, multiple fellowships and awards, which I won't list, and entered many faculty. Shirley, uh, very, very glad to have you with us. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Shaham, for the uh, kind invitation and the introduction. Uh, yeah, it's a really great pleasure to present our recent work uh, across the ocean. I think, you know, this, uh, I, I visited GIS back in 2008, and it was a really memorable visit. I wish I could go back, but um, I think Zoom is now making all these uh, uh, across the ocean interactions possible. So let me try to share my screen. Can you see the slides okay? We can see the slides, yeah. Okay, Perfect. great. Yeah, so um, yeah, so today my talk is integrating genomics and computation for cancer target and drug discovery. Um, so we know that uh, immune checkpoint blockade has brought paradigm shifts to cancer treatment, although even with PD-1, pd one and uh, CTLA-4 antibodies, only a minority of cancer patients can really benefit. It's been estimated that only less than 15% of patients can benefit from current um, checkpoint blockade. And so the big question is, can we find additional targets to improve immunotherapy response? And so um, we have heavily used the two uh, CRISPR screens for target identification. So a CRISPR knockout screens can test the function of thousands of genes for a particular phenotype in millions of cells simultaneously in one Petri dish or in one mouse. So there are a number of experiments that you can do um, that's for targeted discovery. For example, we can just grow the cancer cells in a Petri dish and knock out different cells uh, sorry, knock out different genes in, in different cells and have the cell grown in a, a population. Um, and then afterwards, sequence out the CRISPR sequence in the cell population and use bioinformatics to figure out if we knock out a particular gene, whether the cancer cell is growing slower or faster. Uh, another type of uh, a CRISPR screen is to 
knockout genes and see which one makes the cell um, over or under express a particular protein marker on the cell surface. Uh, and we can sort the cells by the expression level or, or protein level of that, uh, uh, of that protein. And the third is a uh, immune co-culture CRISPR screen. So we can knock out different genes in the cancer cells and then co-culture this with a immune cell. This can be T cells or NK cells. Uh, and then we ask which gene knockout in the cancer cell make the cancer cell more or less susceptible to an immune attack. Um, and so this is kind of still in vitro or ex vivo. And the last type is in vivo CRISPR screen where we knock out uh, genes in different uh, cancer cells, but have this mixture implanted into the mouse to grow into a tumor. And so these are immune competent mice with full immune system. And so we can see which gene knockout makes the tumor grow under uh, the full immune function in the mouse. And so today, um, my talk will focus on this last um, paper, which we published last year using in vivo CRISPR screens. So um, for this experiment, um, we first used a cancer cell line that overexpress an artificial antigen. This is to stimulate stronger immune response. And then we can transfect the cells with a CRISPR uh, library. And so knock out the different uh, genes in different uh, cancer cells. We use a uh, CRISPR library that's designed by our own group. So we have an algorithm for designing CRISPR screen, uh, either single guide or designing a CRISPR screening uh, custom library. And so uh, for here, we, we targeted uh, like 4, 000, over 4,500 genes with five guides per gene. Um, and then we select those cells that have the CRISPR, um, and then we grow the cell under different conditions. One is in vitro, one is new mice without T cell, one is wild type with functioning T cell. The other is wild type mice uh, pre-immunized with ovalbumin because the cancer cell also overexpress ovalbumin. Basically that immunization is like a vaccine. So uh, the, the mouse will have a stronger reaction to the implanted tumor. And finally, uh, it's a uh, wild type mice with the ovalbumin immunization and we add PD-1. This will have an even stronger immune response. Um, and then we grow the, the, the tumor for a while and then isolate the tumor and then uh, extract out the CRISPR sequence for high throughput analysis. And so here uh, we, we use a magic algorithm developed in my lab to identify the hits. Although you know, in, a, in a mouse in vivo CRISPR screen, because the total number of cells we can implant to the, in the, the mice are very limited. And so the result for the initial CRISPR screen might be weaker. Therefore, in order to get better results, we used 79 hits from the first library and then constructed a secondary library now with eight guides per gene. So we have better guide coverage. And also for each guide, we have more cells to, to have better representation. And then we can repeat this CRISPR screen um, and, and just do it again and get better or more robust result. And so you can see, indeed, the tumor can grow in a more immune-dependent way. Um, the tumor is growing really fast in new mice. It's slower in the uh, immune-competent mice, and then even slower with ovalbumin immunization, and then the slowest with uh, anti-PD-1 treatment and immunization. And the right is the same uh, idea, and every dot is one replicate of the tumor. And so after we got the CRISPR screen result, uh, again, we use this magic algorithm, which was developed in my group. And um, for each, we compare the wild type mice with new mice, or the wild type mice uh, with ovalbumin and compare with new mice, or the wild type with ovalbumin immunization and anti-PD-1 with the new mice. And we ask, what is the difference? Then that's really trying to identify a immune-related tumor growth factor. And uh, to, to our happy surprise, you know, the secondary screen give, uh, screen give us a very strong hit, and it's the same uh, every time compared the wild type mice with the immune deficient mice. Um, and so you can see the top hit is a, a gene called COP1. And we repeated this particular uh, CRISPR screen not only uh, in the original uh, 41 model, this is a triple negative breast cancer. Uh, but also in EMT6, another triple negative breast cancer and MC38 colon cancer models. And we can always see COP1 as a strong hit. And so to validate that, um, we grow the um, 
the, the 41 cell, uh, we either wild type or uh, with a COP1 knockout, we use two different guide RNA to knock out COP1. And we can grow this tumor in either nude mice, wild type mice, or wild type mice treated with anti PD1. And interestingly, in the nude mice, when we knock out COP1, the tumor is actually growing slightly even uh, faster. However, in the wild type mice, when we knock out COP1, you can really see the tumor growing slower and even slower uh, with PD-1 treatment. Um, this is tumor grown for a short period. We can even uh, wait for a longer time, and we can see that this is translated into uh, better survival. And so it supports that COP-1 influence the tumor growth and survival, and this is really a immune-dependent phenotype because in the nude mice, we see very different uh, phenotype in here. And so the very first observation is that we use large-scale in vivo CRISPR screen to identify a cancer cell intrinsic gene. This gene is in the cancer cells. This is COP1 in regulating an immune-dependent tumor growth. And so then we ask, what is COP1 doing in the tumors? Uh, to understand this better, because we know it's a cancer intrinsic mechanism, we knock out the uh, COP1 with two different guide RNA and did RNA seq analysis. And we notice many, many genes uh, significantly downregulated. And uh, when we look at the pathway, they are really heavily enriched in macrophage uh, chemo attractant, macrophage activation, and uh, uh, TNF and uh, uh, cell adhesion molecules. This is on the RNA level. We also did a protein uh, cytokine array. So on this array, there are many different uh, probes for proteins, uh, cytokines. It's not all of the cytokines, it covers like 96 different cytokines. And again, we see an overall decrease in cytokine protein level in the cancer cells. And so it, it seems like when we knock out COP1, um, the 41 cancer cells have a reduction of macrophage associated uh, chemokines and cytokines and, and macrophage activation cytokines. And this can be translated in vivo. So when we use, uh, CRISPR to knock out COP1, implant the cancer cell into the tumor, and then we uh, take out the fine tumor to look at um, immune cell infiltration. This is from fact sorting. This is from IHC staining. We can see indeed um, the macro infiltration into the tumors are, are decreased. So in, in the right side, you can see the red are macrophage. And after we knock out uh, COP1, macrophage infiltration into the tumors are significantly reduced. We can also repeat this observation uh, in single cell RNA-seq analysis. Um, and you can see um, in the COP1 knockout tumor, actually the M1 macrophage seemed to increase a little bit, but the M2 macrophage uh, decreased significantly. Um, it's known that M1 macrophage are anti-tumor and M2 macrophage are pro-tumor. And so after we knock out COP1, the good macrophage increase and the bad macrophage decrease. And so that seemed to be what is uh, um, COP1 doing in the tumors. Um, it can control the immune-dependent tumor growth by um, regulating macrophage infiltration into the tumors. Uh, so then the next question is, how is this regulation happening? How does it you know, regulate macrophage infiltration? Um, so we know that COP1 is a E3 ubiquitin ligase, and its function is to degrade some substrate proteins. And previous literature suggests that uh, COP1 has important uh, substrate uh, transcription factors as substrate. And the known family of transcription factors that are can be uh, COP1 can, can be degraded by COP1 includes. Um, CBP delta, AP1, and uh, um, uh, uh, ADS family of transcription factors. And so in order to understand you know, which one might be, in this case, uh, regulated by COP1, we use another computational algorithm developed in my lab. It's called LISA. Um, so previously, uh, we, we have uh, collected uh, many published ChIP-seq data. Um, so we know which transcription factor might be regulating which gene. And then after that, we developed this tool called LISA. When you have a list of differentially expressed gene, you can enter into LISA and it will use the Systrom collected ChIP-seq data um, to see which transcription factors target genes are significantly up or down-regulated 
um, and whether they are enriched in the user input data. And so from there, based on the list of differential expressed genes, we can predict which regulators might be influenced or, or might be related. And so um, we look at the um, the cancer cells uh, that are differentially uh, or the differential genes upon COPPA knockout in the cancer cells. Um, so here we run the upregulated genes and the downregulated genes in the CRISPR uh, knockout cancer cells. And then we ask what kind of transcription factors are enriched in regulating those up or down regulated genes. And um, you can see here um, for the down regulated genes, which we know are related to macrophage cytokines, um, two transcription factors, at least family of transcription factors, seem to be really enriched. One is CEBP, the other is AP1. Um, although ADS is known to be a copon substrate, at least from differential gene expression, we don't see it as uh, being predicted uh, as a, a regulator here. And so um, this is just from differential expression. And then next we ask, if COP1 can degrade a transcription factor, then that transcription factor uh, might have weaker binding to the chromatin. And we might be able to see that from a tax seek. Therefore, uh, we did a tax seek of the cancer cells with uh, both the control and the CRISPR knockout of uh, COP1. And indeed, you can see um, there are fewer peaks that are weaker, uh, but a lot stronger uh, peaks that are, are that I guess stronger um, ataxic peaks. Because when we knock out COP1, the transcription factor now are binding the chromatin stronger because they are no longer being degraded by the COP1 E3 ligase. Um, and so we did motif analysis on these peaks that are stronger and we, which we believe are transcription factors that can bind to the chromatin uh, with a stronger footprint. And so from that motif analysis, uh, uh, we, we actually saw all three family of transcription factors, AP1, which is labeled you know, with the blue dots, CBP, which is labeled the red dots, and the ADS family, uh, which is labeled the green dots. And there's another motif, which seemed to be a combination of CBP and AP1, they overlap. And so based on the uh, ataxic signal, it seems that indeed when we knock out COP1, um, AP1, CBP, and ADS are all uh, more stable and they are binding to the chromatin uh, with a stronger uh, open chromatin signature. And, and then the next we, we tested proteomics, we asked, okay, if we knock out COP1, um, do we, which protein become more stable? And, uh, uh, and so we followed by a proteomics analysis and we ask which proteins are upregulated. Um, and so you can see here, uh, ADS family, AP1 family, and CEBP family are all upregulated. Um, and uh, in order to make sure that this is really a uh, proteo, pro pro protein degradation related, we also use a proteosome inhibitor to see you know, which of these app regulation is uh, abolished when uh, we use the proteasome inhibitor. And based on that, we got the strongest hit, which is this uh, transcription factor called the CEBP delta. Um, and so from basically from both the differential RNA-seq, differential attack-seq, and the differential proteomics, uh, we, they all supported that a CEBP is important. And based on proteomics, we thought this is probably a CEBP delta. And so in order to really kind of validate that, um, we did a, um, a CEBP delta a chip seek analysis of the wild type cells, the control knockout, and the COP1 knockout um, of CEBP. Um, and so we, we can see basically um, this is in the control, but when we knock out COP1, CEBP delta transcription factor is more. Uh, has more stable proteins and they can bind to the chromatin stronger. Indeed, on these previous CEBP binding sites, they can actually bind much, much stronger now. Um, and so previously, also in my lab, we, we developed an algorithm to combine the CHIP-seq and the differential expression to see whether the transcription factor uh, 
can is is upregulating or downregulating gene expression. What are the pathways? What are the motifs that are are different in the upstream or in in the up or downregulated genes? Um, and so interestingly, we see that um, for the for the motif in the upregulated peaks, they are indeed really enriched in the CEBP uh, motif, which means that you know these upregulated peaks indeed are directly bound by CEBP delta. Whereas the motifs uh, that are enriched in the, there are some peaks that are weaker. You can see here, they are actually enriched in AP1 motif, suggesting that AP1 might be a secondary effect. Whereas CBP delta is the primary effect after COP1 knockout. And this directly influences CBP delta binding to the chromatin. Um, and, but then actually, uh, we look at the attack seek and the uh, Chip seek peak, it turns out CBP delta it can act as a transcriptional suppressor to suppress the transcription of macrophage associated cytokines. And so, um, in this particular figure, we are looking at the level of differential expression um, of genes. Either so, the x axis represents the differential gene expression after COP1 knockout. And the y-axis represents the differential gene expression after CEBP knockout. And every dot represents a gene that's either a cytokine or a cytokine receptor. And if we look at this, they, they seem to really have an opposite effect. And so basically, uh, anything that's kind of uh, uh, regulated in, by CEBP delta in one direction, when we, uh, when we knock out COP1, you see an opposite effect. Um, and, and when we look at the gene ontology analysis of the forty uh, of the COP1 knockout versus the CEBP knockout, you can see um, the top regulated pathways are identical, and but then they are completely opposite of each other. Um, basically, when CEBP uh, is knocked out, all these genes are regulated and they are related to um, macrophage uh, cy Chemokine or chemokine receptor uh, or chemokine um, uh, like for, for macrophage. And so basically CBP delta normally suppress this gene expression, but when we knock it out, all of these cytokines are now upregulated. In contrast, um, COP1 has completely opposite effect. When we knock out COP1, all of these cytokines are decreased. Um, and, and so to really show that um, this is giving us opposite effect, we also tested this in vivo. Let me see, there's a question. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, um, yeah, so um, we also test this in vivo. You can see here um, uh, on the left side, we first make sure that we can knock out COP1. Uh, so this is a COP1 knockout. You can see the protein level is gone. Uh, but then in the COP1 knockout, Interestingly, you can see here, CEBP delta protein is stronger. However, in the CEBP delta knockout, uh, you can see here the CEBP delta protein is not there, but the COP1 protein is still there. Um, we also generated a double knockout by getting rid of both COP1 and uh, CEBP delta. And uh, when we uh, grew these in, in mouse for, tum for tumor growth, and also we treated them with uh, anti-PV1, um, you can see here, um, so on the left side, you can see, uh, so, sorry, on the right side, this one, we have anti-PD-1 treatment. On the left side, these are just tumor grown without uh, anti-PD-1 treatment. Um, you can see here, um, basically, when we knock out COP1, the tumors are growing slower. Uh, with anti-PD-1 treatment, it's the same phenotype. The tumor is growing slower as well. However, this is dependent on the cancer cells with CBP delta present. Once we knock out the CBP delta, that uh, COP1 knockout effect is completely gone. And the double knockout also is, uh, is that benefit is also gone. So now um, without CBP delta, the tumor is growing just as fast, regardless of whether we have the COP1 knockout or not. Um, and so this means that um, the benefit of a COP1 knockout in controlling tumor growth is mediated through this transcription factor CBP delta. And so um, 
we, we then look at uh, uh, public data. Uh, so previously we did all the analysis in mouse tumors. We want to make sure that this is a, a potential phenotype also in human tumors. And so this is uh, um, looking at the TCGA tumors um, to see, um, so here each column represent, uh, your each kind of colored bar represent a particular cancer type. And the red are tumors, blue are adjacent normal or you know, in the TCGA. And when you see the three dots or the, you know, the, the dotted uh, bars, this means there's a significant uh, differential expression. And so you can see here, in most of the cancer types across TCGA, COP1 is upregulated in human tumors. And so we use uh, another algorithm previously developed in our lab to look at you know, whether um, a particular gene, in this case, either COP1 or CBP delta, is correlated with overall macrophage infiltration or uh, M2 macrophage um, infiltration in the tumors. And so overall, we can see that when COP1 expression level is high across many, many different uh, can human cancer types, um, the COP1 expression is positively correlated with an M2 macrophage uh, phenotype uh, or expression signature. Interestingly, CEBP delta is opposite. High expression of CEBP delta is negatively correlated with the M2 macrophage signature. Um, and also the COP1 knockout signature, which is opposite from the COP1 signature also is, is um, um, negatively correlated with overall macrophage Lab infiltration level in the tumors. And so this again suggests that COP1 and CEBP data have opposite effect in the tumors and they are associated with macrophage infiltration and especially the M2 macrophage in the human cancers. And so um, up to here, um, we know that, you know, COP1 seem to be important and the mechanism of that is that, you know, we, we integrate RNA-seq, attack-seq, proteomics, and chip-seq we can identify that COP1 has a substrate, which is a transcription factor, CEBP delta. And normally CEBP delta can be a transcriptional suppressor to suppress the macrophage chemokine transcription. Uh, but then this uh, CEBP delta transcription factor can be degraded by this COP1 E3 ligase. Um, and then we, we ask, how does COP1 really degrade CEBP delta? Uh, so we thought, okay, maybe it can directly recognize the substrate um, on the uh, on the on the protein uh, by recognizing uh, a diagram motif. So very often, um, a E three ligase can recognize a specific peptide sequence called a diagram on the substrate, and then uh, bring this to uh, uh, the proteasome for degradation. And so COP one's diagram is known. And so we look at all the proteomics data uh, with potential target that have a COP1 diagram. Uh, but to our surprise, you know, this target that have so good, you know, CEBP delta that has such a good support from both RNA-seq, attack-seq, proteomics, and chip-seq does not have a COP1 diagram motif. So you can see here, um, anything that have a, a COP1 diagram, we have a little circle around it. But CBP delta does not have a um, COP1 diagram. So at that time, we were a little puzzled. Uh, but then we read the literature. Previously, uh, it's, uh, it was reported that TRIP2 could be a very strong COP1. Uh, it has a very strong COP1 diagram motif, and it can be a uh, adapter to link COP1 with CBP delta. So instead of COP1 directly recognizing CEBP delta as um, a substrate, in the middle, there's another adapter, uh, potentially TRIP2 as the, uh, as, as the, uh, uh, like the adapter to, to bring CEBP delta to COP1. And so we analyzed the COP1 data indeed, you know, there's a TRIP2, uh, both both trip one and trip two have uh, this particular motif, but uh, trip one was not detected in our uh, proteomics data. So we believe it's the trip two uh, as the adapter which brings CEBP to the E3 ligase of of COP one. 
Um, and so um, in order to show that indeed this is the adapter, we, we, tr we try to do a co-IP of the three proteins. And indeed, um, we, we can see that uh, each one of them uh, can co-IP with the other two. Um, and also, if we knock out the trip two, it can really disrupt the interaction between COP1 and CBP delta. Um, so you can see here um, in, in the trip two knockout, when we use the COP1 to co-IP, we are no longer pulling down CBP delta. Whereas uh, in the uh, well type, um, we can use COP1 to pull down CBP delta. So it really shows that these three co-IP and it's dependent on the uh, trip two as an adapter. Um, and also when we look at um, COP1 knockout, you can see here, uh, when we knock out COP1 uh, on trip two and CBP delta on the RNA level, um, there are very small changes. In fact, CBP delta on the RNA level might have even a slight decrease. Um, However, at the protein level, um, when we knock out COP1, you can see both TRIP2 um, and uh, CBP delta, their proteins become much, much more stable, even though their RNA level have either no change or even slight decrease, their protein levels are much, much stronger, um, which means that COP1 is related to the protein degradation of TRIP2 and CBP delta. And also in here, when we knock out the trip two, you can see here we use two different guide RNA to knock out trip two. Uh, indeed, uh, this can uh, really influence the uh, CBP delta uh, degradation. So um, once trip two is knocked out, um, COP1 can no longer degrade the CBP delta protein in here. And so um, this suggests this support that trip two is the adapter in the COP1 dependent ubiquitinization and protein degradation of CEBP delta. And so here is the final uh, mechanism that uh, we, are, we, we derived. So normally CEBP is a transcription factor and it, it can be transcriptionally suppressing the macrophage cytokine infiltration into the tumors. However, in the tumors, COP1 are very often upregulated and through this adapter trip, trip two, it can link to CEBP delta and at the protein level degrade the transcription factor CEBP delta. And that will uh, result in uh, increased macrophage chemokine and macrophage activation. And this will bring macrophage into the tumor. And these are M2 type of macrophages, which will help the macrophage grow. Um, but, uh, 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 but yeah, normally uh, this whole complex would uh, uh, suppress the, uh, this whole complex get degraded. Um, so um, which, which, you know, like since COP1 is upregulated, so it supports COP1 as a promising immunotherapy target. And if we can inhibit COP1, we can regulate chemokine secretion, tumor macrophage infiltration, and anti-PD-1 response. So um, yeah, so this is the work that we I did uh, among the like final work that I did at the Farber. Uh, so the all the experimental work were conducted by two talented experimental postdocs that are jointly supervised between our lab and Miles Brown's lab, uh, Xiao Qing Wang and uh, Shen Qinggu, and both of them are are uh, having their independent faculty positions now, and the uh, computational work were also jointly done by uh, Bin Bin Wang and Colin Hokai. So Bin Bin did uh, all the CRISPR screen analysis and Colin did all the analysis to figure out the mechanism of action of COP1 and uh, CBP Delta. And this is like in collaboration with uh, many other members in the lab as well as the CFCE. Um, so I hope this can show you how CRISPR screen and bioinformatics combined can identify novel targets and also um, identify interesting mechanisms of uh, tumor immune evasion.